Hello strangers, I'm Vi, and this is Neon Static, where every week you can get an original, true scary story for the low, low price of free fitty. This one is story 205, and this one hurts because it's very close to home base. In some ways, the military was a lot like school. You end up being friends with whoever's in proximity. People from your graduating boot camp, your A schools, what deployment schedule you get on. I became friends with a group of guys who, from all the above, were regulars in my life. This story concerns three of them, Fox, Peterson, and Connor. As happens with groups, I was closest with a couple of them, Fox and Peterson. Unsurprising on paper, I'd met them both all the way back in boot. Connor was about six months ahead of us, so he was at our first duty station before we got there. Thus, he joined our little group late. But it wasn't just that. Connor was different. He was one of those guys who was always working an angle. He was the kind of guy to go to the same formation, get the same instructions as the rest of us from the sergeant or whoever was running the agenda for why all the troops had assembled that morning. But by the time we were dismissed from formation and turned around, he was already plotting out what we were actually going to do. Ways we would cut this corner or we would sneak something into our bags on a rock. Just little ways we wouldn't follow the clear directions we just got. We, as in we, all three of us, were expected to disregard Sergeant's words for Connor's. And if he did get caught, well, it wouldn't just be him on the chopping block. That's what I mean. I'd say he was an independent thinker, but rarely were his schemes independent. He wouldn't go through with them without assuring first that we were on board with doing whatever it was with him, or at least that we agreed with him. Connor became a regular part of our small circle of friends though, and I was friendly with him. But over time, I developed this sort of watchful feeling about the guy, like some cheesy formula TV show. I'd see the look on his face, the look of Oh, but here's what I think we should do. And inside I'd just go, oh boy, what's he going to get into next? And I wasn't the only one, apparently. He didn't always get away with his little plans, and it wasn't unusual for him to be put on some light punishment, weekend duty, stuff like that, in the time we knew him. The sergeants may have been fooled a few times, but it was clear some of them were catching on watching Connor with the same feeling of unease as to his reliability, or lack thereof, that I felt. We were all at that duty station for a couple few years, first in the barracks, but then, when we hit a certain time in, we got the option to receive housing allowance and reside off base. Except for Connor. He'd pulled some stunt. It had been bad enough or all of his previous little mistakes had rolled into a large enough ball of crap that he'd done wrong, that he was restricted from moving off post for a while yet, in spite of having been there longer than us. Anyway, Fox and Peterson found apartments in the same complex, and I in another complex a little closer to our duty station. The area directly around military bases is always rough. It's usually dotted with payday loan places, and liquor stores, and a heightened rate of car break-ins. But that was what was available when I looked. At least my apartment was both cheaper and larger to make up for being so close to post, with three bedrooms for the price of the far nicer two bedrooms farther away. Coupled with Connor still being stuck on base, my spot became the de facto hangout and it was at my apartment where we planned a night out in the town, capped with a house party at a house another few guys we knew were renting. It was out in the city, close to the bar crawl area. We'd been to that house before. We knew the guys well enough. I dare say we'd had that exact kind of night, bar, bar, house party, uber back, before. 
It was low risk. It should have been fun. And yet, I remember the beginning of that night so clear. I can still remember getting up to go to the kitchen to grab a Coke and stepping on a pebble in my bare feet. The little rocks mottled gray blended in with the landlord's special brown gray flecked carpet. I even recall what was being said, that Fox already had a 24 pack of beer to bring to the house party first, myself another 24 pack, and Peterson a handle of something higher octane. It was sort of our cover charge of entry, sort of good manners. And then Peterson said it, Connor's probably going to bulk or just piggyback off of one of your two beer packs. You know how he rolls. And that's when I felt it. This sudden bolt of something. Sharp, bad. I'd been alive 24 years at that point, and I'd never had such a terrible, certain feeling about anything in my life before. The second Peterson had mentioned his name, every piece of anxiety he'd ever caused the low simmer of fear of getting roped into something, getting caught. It all seemed to bubble up out of nowhere. My scalp felt tingly like my hair was standing on end. It was so strong my mouth opened, and I heard myself say, He can take mine. I'm not going. Fox and Peterson looked at me, but as Fox's mouth opened, there came that demanding, pounding knock on the door. Any chance that the three of us could air it out, dissipated like smoke in high wind. Fox's mouth shut, and he got up and let Connor into my apartment. You'd think from that huge reaction to just his name that seeing Connor stride into my apartment, empty-handed, of course, would have had me like projectile vomiting or spouting blood from sudden stigmata. No, his presence didn't set off any additional alarm bells. He plunked down on the couch and began one of his stories, him there holding court in my living room like he usually did, and my other two friends looking at him, nodding and listening. It was also normal. I felt vaccinated from whatever had happened only moments before, like the spores of him built into a tolerance I barely tolerated. The edge of that sudden, sure panic, though, was dulled. And when it came time to depart, I came along, toting my 24-pack of beer that Connor was quick to rest a hand on as it sat between us in the back of the lift. But that bad feeling wasn't completely papered over. After we dropped the alcohol off at the house and then hit bars one, two, and three, there were these little moments Flashes where my neck would just ripple into goosebumps when I glanced at the blocky back of his head. My mouth, just splashed with beer, would suddenly dry out bone dry as his eyes alighted on his phone, lighting up his face in the dreary light of the bar. And when we walked back into that house party, buzzed and ready to tie it on, Connor bumped against me, shoving into the house before me. The contact made all the beer in my gut pickle. I had to run to the bathroom. My mouth was watering in that way it does when you're about to puke. Like the pebble I stepped on earlier that night, I remember so clearly I can still see it, bending over that toilet. There was no way I or anyone sane would kneel anywhere near it. The phrase sour mash in my head made the liquor slosh in me, but it never actually climbed up my throat to leave. I gulped a couple of palmfuls of water from the sink. I felt better. I looked at my reflection in the spotty mirror. I didn't look like I'd seen a ghost or have any weird supernatural sensation when I looked into my own eyes. I looked tired, tense, but otherwise, same old unremarkable face. It was weird to look so normal considering how I kept getting such a terrible feeling like I expected it to be bruising me, showing somehow. And locking eyes with my reflection, I talked myself down. See, look, you're fine. It's a normal night. Connor's back on his bullshit, when is he not, but no more so than before. You're just letting it all build up because he's a leech. The freeloading, the trying to drag you into the shit with him. 
but it's not. And I remember thinking this word so clearly, my hands gripping the sink. It's not evil. Weird word choice to pop up, right? And at that word, I almost laughed. Traumatic much? I ran the water a second time. I took another couple of gulps. And when I emerged back into the mirror, I looked less drawn, more relaxed. I laughed at myself. I laughed at my overblown, ridiculous reaction I'd been feeding all night. And I decided to just walk right back out and accept that my supposed gut instinct was dead wrong. I walked out of that bathroom and my eyes landed on the back of Connor's head again. I near laughed. The dude really did have a Lego-shaped dome. I would have to inform him of this fact later on, just playful ribbing the way he ripped on me for my wide-ass flipper feet. He stepped to his right, and I saw who he was talking to. It wasn't Fox or Peterson. It was a girl from the unit, newer than us, a girl named Robinson. She was pretty. I mean, all girls are, really, but, like, her type of pretty was low-key. It stood out. Usually army girls do a lot with makeup and clothes and stuff when they're out. Kind of make up for the uniform standards, keeping them really plain when we're on duty. But she didn't wear a lot of makeup that night. She was casual in a t-shirt, shorts, and kids. But she still drew attention, glances from around the room. Connor wasn't glancing, though. He was enthralled. And something about that began to make the hackles on my neck rise, until Fox bumped my shoulder. Oh, good, he's preoccupied. When you were in the bathroom, he was really into the idea of us all playing Mickey Forty Hands. I'd rather play in traffic. I laughed and told Fox to remember the safety brief, no subtracting from the population that weekend. My response was quick, and just as quick, that relief I'd talked myself into moments prior came right back. The house party was completely normal after that. We played pool. We drank a few more beers. We wandered inside and outside of the house, just catching up with so-and-so back from the last deployment. It was near 3 a.m. by the time I knew my eyelids weren't going to stay up much longer, and I began rounding up the guys to catch a rideshare back to our respective places, or determine if they were going to be honored guests of Casa de Mi. Fox and Peterson were easy enough to find and Peterson already had his phone out, ordering a car. I asked them where Connor was, looking to the closed bathroom door and assuming he was making room for more. But Fox surprised me and told me, oh no man, he left already. My scalp tingled again. Do what? Peterson glanced up now. He told me he and Robinson hit it off, I guess. Saw the two of them take a ride share a bit ago, so he's good for the night. Peterson tapped on his phone and then looked up at me, confirming they were still cool to stay at my place. I said all right. I didn't feel all right. Not at all. And as we got into the back of the car, and I watched the streetlights beginning to win their battle against the dark as the sun filtered in for sunrise, I continued to not feel all right. Something. My stomach. My hair. My dry, stupid tongue. Something... Something was wrong. Really, really wrong. At once, I opened Facebook. I began clicking through my friends, then friends of friends, scanning their accounts. I suddenly had this sick, sharp need to find Robinson, to reach out to her however I could. I had no proof. I had no reason, no real one. We'd never even spoken. We only knew of each other through social osmosis. But in that moment, the feeling wasn't aimless or hard to nail down. It was certain, and it was terror. But I couldn't find her. Either she was still so new to the squadron, no one had added her yet, or her social media was private. I told myself, when we get to my place, I'll get her number off someone, or we'll call Connor, make something up. I knew I'd sound crazy, and more than likely I'd just be off base. But at the same time, I knew I wasn't crazy. And in fact, if I didn't say anything now, I'd go crazy. We hadn't even made it into my apartment. We were standing in the hallway. 
There was this yellow overhead light. It made everything look sickly. I blurted out, asking my friends, either of you got Robinson's number? Fox eyed me and then snorted, telling me it was a little late to play Battle Buddy, referring to how everybody in the army is told to watch out for each other. Always look out for your Battle Buddy. But his eyes darted down as he rifled through his pockets. Sergeant had reamed out a guy for missing a call, and Fox, not wanting to be the next one, had printed off the latest recall roster. Peterson's voice cut through, saying, Guys, Fox didn't look up, and I didn't look away from Fox. Fox laughed, telling him to hold on a second, because I had to play Captain save -a But Peterson didn't hold on. He repeated it. Guys. I looked, and Peterson was wearing the nasty feeling I'd had all night over his own face. He continued, She won't pick up. My heart was hammering, and I asked him, Why? What? What's happened? I was thinking, I'm too late. My thought was so loud, I only caught Peterson continuing to talk, saying the word, Hospital. I looked up and rejoined the conversation as Peterson shook his head saying something like, a mountain lion. What did he do to her? I asked. But I knew, and I'd known. I'd had that awful feeling of terror and fear, but now guilt and shame were weighing in on the cocktail of awful feelings I'd been drinking all night. But Peterson looked at me, his face pale as a sheet, rendered Swiss cheese color in the yellow light. He said, what? No, Connor. Connors in the hospital. None of us knew Robinson, but over the next few months, we got to know her through the time-honored tradition of rumint, rumor intelligence. I heard a lot, and honestly, I asked a lot from the few girls I was friends with, because I still felt sideways about everything. The girls told me, through bits and pieces, why Robinson was pretty but in a subdued, almost hidden way. Why she wasn't flashy or overcompensating. It was on purpose, because Robinson had had a rough time before the military. As it was explained to me, her dressing down and staying under the radar were to avoid the same kind of thing, drawing the wrong kind of attention from the wrong kind of guy from happening again. Something else I learned about from my friends was the reflexive survival responses. You know, fight or flight. Only most of my friends told me that from what they'd experienced or heard about from other girls, it was more common to freeze entirely or fawn over their attacker, sort of hoping to win over whoever was hurting them to make whatever happened less if only because they wouldn't be pissed on top of whatever it was that drove the bastards to hurt them in the first place. Not Robinson, though. No. No flight. No freeze. No fawn. She was all fight. Only turned up to something even more. Frenzy. Fury. And when Connor had pressed in on her, cajoling, calmly talking her into his plan the way he did with us, only using his size to corner her, his hands moving over her as though he'd already changed her mind, her no into a yes. Well, that did it. Her past had dug itself out of the neat little grave she'd buried it in, and she'd gone apeshit, clawing, biting. She'd had a utility knife. She'd battled an unprepared Connor down until he looked as Peterson had described medical saying, like he'd been attacked by a mountain lion. We all had to come in and give statements to SECFO, security forces. It had happened off post, so the local police were involved too, and our statements were passed to them. Robinson was missing for a while from formations and the deployment schedule. Word is, she got transferred off to another post. Part mercy, a fresh start for her away from the swirling rumors that I own part of the blame for, 
whether my intentions were good or not, but also part to sort of push away what had happened from the forefront. Heartless or not, we had a mission to support. The sooner we got back on task, the sooner things would return to normal for us too. But not for Connor. He was in the hospital for a while before he recovered enough to stand trial. Weasel that he was, he pled to lesser charges, but that didn't spare him entirely from prison. It was much too big for that. From what I heard, he played the part in court of a remorseful guy who made a mistake, who'd never hurt anyone, but I never heard it from him personally. None of the three of us, Fox, Peterson, or me, did, because after that night, we all told him he was dead to us, and if he came around us or any of our friends again, we'd make that audience a whole lot larger. Peterson got out for some job with his dad, but Fox and I are still in. PCS'd to a new post, but we keep in touch. I have some more rank now. Now I'm the one holding formations and giving safety briefings. Nothing revolutionary comes out of me. I don't have any hand wringing or dramatics. I just say the same don't drink, don't drive, don't put fireworks in the microwave kind of things we have to say, or the little morons will show up on Monday without some fingers. But when I'm up there, I'm scanning their faces, and I'm listening. I messed up once, and Robinson paid the price. If I ever get that feeling again, I promise I'll do something about it. Of all the stories that drive fear into my heart, friendly fire ones like that, they're the worst. There's this whole theory, it's called the missing stair. Essentially, think of a staircase in your house where you know that one step is dodgy, wasn't nailed in right, or it's weak. And you know to avoid it because it's your house and you're familiar. You just have to remember to warn anybody else who maybe isn't as familiar. Hey, watch your step with that one. Watch out for yourselves out there, but watch out for others too. Do you have something to say or have something to share? Social media and email are in the description, and the comments remain available to anybody who wants to use them. Liking and subscribing for more is always appreciated, but never required. I'm just so happy you've tuned in, and I hope this finds you safe and well. Then until next time, Take care, strangers.